Our epistle reading today comes from Romans chapter 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, You shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That there's one thing that I can count on every time that my extended family gathers for holidays or other gatherings. Yes, certainly there always is the traditional food at the traditional holidays to fulfill all of the traditional expectations. But it's more than that. The thing that I can count on happening sooner or later is my brother-in-law playing his favorite game of getting my father riled up about politics. Is that life is just going on as normal and then you can almost sense when it's going to happen. A little smirk comes on his face and a little glint in his eyes and then the question comes that all of a sudden The topics of conversation simply veer off course and now it is all about politics from there. Maybe you can relate in your own family. Is that Paul in our reading from Romans today can certainly relate. For much the same thing happens in Romans chapter 13. Paul has been moving right along in his epistle. Is that he's been covering all sorts of the big topics. Everything from the gift of God's undeserved grace to the gift of God's new life to us in baptism. To the very power of life in the Holy Spirit. And to the promises of the new creation. That even that there is nothing, even death, that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Paul just keeps trucking along to then talk about the beauty of being a part of the body of Christ and the possibilities of the life of humility and hope, a life of love and service, hospitality and harmony within the church as Paul speaks all about that hope that God has given within his body, the church. And then And then suddenly, Paul gets, well, he gets political. (laughs) 
So that all of a sudden, it moves from this conversation, all, all of these things going on within the body and within the church, and now Paul shifts and turns the conversation. And the topic changes, and now Paul draws his hearers into the nitty-gritty topics of law and order, is it of authority and power, crime and punishment, of the, difference, the, the differences between the governed and the government. Paul all of a sudden now brings these Roman Christians into the midst of things. And I think that some of them may have asked the question, how did we get here? But there may be some of us that as we look out into our lives, our community, out into our nation, that might be asking that same question. How did we get here? As we look out and as we see all of the political problems, the social unrest, the general animosity and distrust that is there within our nation all around as we see it, where do we turn? Is that where do we go? What do we believe? Who do we trust? And what is the answer to everything that is out there in this life? Those questions are just as much alive to us, to, uh, alive for us today as they were for the very Christians in Rome as Paul brought up this question of politics in his. And so as Paul makes this shift in Romans 13 from the topics of the church to the topics of life, is that he doesn't begin to speak of political ideology. He doesn't begin to talk about party politics or historical justification or anything else of the sort. Paul begins to speak theologically. He begins to speak those words about God and the impact of that God on our life as Christians in our very real situations that we find ourselves. So that Paul begins to reflect upon the question. That how does the Christian relate both to the government and to the society of which he or she is a part? To put it another way, is that where do we find our place within this life in which we live? Especially considering that Paul was writing to those who found themselves as Christians in Rome living in the midst of a pagan government in a pagan empire supported by a pagan religion and they being something so small in the midst of something so big. See, Romans 12, Paul begins to speak of what life is to be like within the church. But Romans 13, Paul now directs our attention of what does this now mean for our life within this world? And so as we begin to turn to those very words, is that Paul makes some pretty bold claims within his situation and setting. Paul begins to speak about what it is that he sees in the midst of everything going on. That Paul begins with these words. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So here's Paul, a Jewish Christian writing to those in Rome. In the very center of the empire, in the very center of a state that is somewhat set up against them. And Paul doesn't call them to escape. He doesn't call them to revolt. Is that he doesn't call them to somehow to go against. Now, what does Paul say? He calls them to order their lives in such a way as to recognize what it is that even the government themselves may not recognize. See, Paul makes the bold claim that even in this life that we may see things differently, that God is still 
in control. For those Roman Christians who were surrounded by pagan culture and a pagan society with a pagan government and pagan rulers, is that Paul now claims of the fact that these are those appointed, not by them, not by their power or dignity or their God-like status, but appointed by the one and true God. That he is still at work behind the scenes, in the midst of history and society, that God is still in control. Just as God was still in control when Pharaoh was the one in charge of the Israelites in Egypt, so also was God in control, even then, as Paul writes in the reign of Nero, as he writes this letter to the Romans. Even now, today, in the midst of our world in which we find ourselves so worried and concerned about where our country is going or what's going to happen, and we have very divided and different opinions, not only of what has gone wrong, but where we should go or who we should vote for or so many other things, that Paul speaks to us words about God, that he is still in control, that our heart may get pumping and we may get rather riled and we may be greatly concerned about many things and hopefully in those moments we turn to the God who is in control, that we align ourselves with him. For as Paul says that there is no authority except from God, now, this doesn't mean that all authority simply has that carte blanche you know, freedom to do whatever they want. But it is that fact that God is still at work and his, has his plans and purposes. But that's where Paul goes on to his second claim. That Paul goes on to speak these words. So that he begins to speak about that fact that for the rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. See, Paul not only claims that God is in control, Paul reminds us of the one true purpose of government itself. That government is there for our good, to promote justice, to maintain order, to provide peace, to support the very operating of society. That this is the amazing thing about the scriptures and what we claim about this world and about our Lord. That even though he is in control of all things and has all power and authority, is that what does he do? That he gives it away. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Go back to those first pages of scripture. In Genesis 1, God appointed the man and the woman to rule and reign over the creatures and creation itself. God who is in charge now gives them power and authority to care and create, to manage and to steward, to maintain and provide. And then in Genesis chapter 2, just right following, what does God give? But an elaborate description of the very gift of husband and wife joined in marriage, of the gift of the promise of children, that God creates that very building block of the family that is the very starting place of society, of true community, that God gives that word of command that we are to honor father and mother, to honor those that God has delegated and given his authority and his care. But we all know what happens. We all know what we are now capable of. Because Genesis 3 
has now turned us so far from being outwardly focused and outwardly turned. But instead, what does Genesis 3 say? That sin has now come into our lives. And as I've been reminded recently by another pastor, is that we have been turned. Turned not outward to others as God desires, but that we begin to be turned in upon ourselves. That God created us to be those that maintain justice, to provide peace, to promote order, and to care for others. And yet when we are turned in on ourselves, then when we reach out with that closed fist of selfishness, we all know what it is capable of producing, not only in our lives, but in the lives of others. See, Paul reminds, Paul reminds us and the Romans of the very fact that government was put there for our good. And so he calls us to be those that also seek to do the good. Not just once or twice, this isn't a single event, but the very word that Paul uses is he calls us to keep on doing good. Why? Not only so that we not be afraid. Not only that we not be afraid that we would somehow be punished or the very power of the government be brought upon us, but that we might have a good conscience as well. See, Paul isn't just simply telling us, get in your place and find your order. No, Paul is calling us back to how society is supposed to work. That government is supposed to be there for our good, for our care, for justice and peace, for the very care of truth and the very care of our society. And we are also called to be those who live in that harmony and that care, doing what is good, doing what is right. That I think in so many ways and in so many places that this is that place, that wherever we are on the political spectrum, wherever we find ourselves in our life, is that we have this chance not to think about what others should do or how others should live. But what is God calling me to be about. That Paul comes and reminds us of the fact that he anchors our very Christian obedience, anchors our life within society, not based upon who's in control, not based of who's in office, not based upon how well they are doing or how, uh, how good they are but the very fact that we see that he is still at work in these times. And he calls us in that very way to see our place. For we live in the midst of the two kingdoms of God. That not only does he reign and rule in his kingdom of the church, where he brings grace and goodness and mercy and compassion into our lives, but God also rules within that kingdom of government and the world. That very kingdom that God seeks for our good and our harmony to create things as they should. And it's right there in the midst of our lives, in the midst of our unique situation, of our unique callings and vocations, that those two kingdoms come together. That God would reign, not just in what we do on Sunday morning, not just what we do in one location, in one place, but where God reigns and rules in our lives for the rest of the week and in all the places of our lives. That what does he call us to? Is that he calls us back to that very promise that he has given to us a different calling, that we indeed are a revolutionary community, but we do not accomplish that either by abandoning society or revolting against society or simply being absorbed by society. 
that we are called by God to live in such a way as to transform society. What does Paul go on to say? As in any good conversation about government, Paul leads us to a conversation about taxes. (laughs) So what does he now begin to say? He says, pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For one, the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. See, we are to pay our debts. To pay our taxes and to pay our honor and to pay our very care for our nation, our world, our church, our family, all of those very blessings in our lives. But there is one debt, that there is one tax that we owe, that we are never to consider ourselves having paid off or to be done with. And that is that very debt love. That Paul does not simply say that debt to our neighbor, but he says that very debt to love each other for the one who loves another. Not just our neighbor. That we can somehow convince ourselves that that means that we love those that are like us and think like us and believe like us. But he knows he calls us to love those that are other than us. He calls us today not just to think politically and theologically about how do we live in the midst of this world, but he calls for us to think of how do we live towards others. That how did that Christian church in Rome and spread throughout many other cities like it, How did those Christians who started on the outskirts in the midst of the very far reaches of the empire now begin that very march to be the very religion that simply changed the very empire itself? How did this very religion that started on the very fringes become the very one at its core? How did it go from that that stood trials and persecutions and stood all sorts of lies and all sorts of vengeance against it? All of a sudden become that very one that transformed the empire and history as we know it. It's the fact that that change did not come by power or by sword or by authority. It came by the changed lives of those Christians that influenced and affected others. That they cared for criminals. They helped the sick. They lived lives of moral virtue like none other. That they lived with a generosity beyond measure and yet were virtuous beyond comprehension. That they were just as equally concerned about caring for those in need as they were about living lives of morality and care. They did not find themselves easily pegged or placed For they lived as those that, as Paul goes on to say in verse 14, those who had put on Christ, for they were loved in such a way that God sent his Son to pay our debt of sin, to love us so much that his love would never give up on us. That isn't that the very words of Christ's church that we are called to hear and called to share. That not only are we his people right here in this church or there within your home, but we are his church out there into our workplaces, our community, our lives, and we are called forth to live lives of generosity and care and service and love that may that love that came to us in Christ Jesus assure us of his great care as he looks to us who have been washed 
by that very love of our Lord Jesus. May that give you that peace of God that surpasses all understanding, that guards your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.